Hello, and welcome to the seventh and final Summer Digital Humanities Virtual Hour. For those that don't know me, I'm Liz Grumbach. I'm the Assistant Director for the Institute for Humanities Research, where I also lead the Digital Humanities Initiative. I wanted to start today by thanking everyone who's attended these virtual hours for the past several months. And thank you to everyone who's watched the virtual recordings on YouTube. It's been fantastic to come together and support each other during the summer of change and the many historical moments that we've all been experiencing together. So while this is the last summer Digital Humanities Hour, IHR is planning to hold virtual Digital Humanities events in the fall as well, and those will be announced later. There is actually now a DH at ASU listserv that I'll be managing. So if you're interested in subscribing to that, go ahead and shoot me either an email or a message um, in the Zoom chat. So before I introduce our presenter today and we kick off the virtual hour, I have as always a few housekeeping things and some virtual hour guidelines. Please now mute your microphones for the duration of the presentation portion of this virtual hour. For Q&A, please either send questions via the Zoom chat function or by raising your hand in Zoom. After you raise your hand, a moderator, likely myself, will unmute you to ask your question. These virtual hours are intended to foster discussion, so there's going to be a lot of time for Q&A uh, towards the end of the virtual hour, so I'm hoping we have a really lively, awesome discussion. And most importantly, the thing I say every virtual hour, because our digital humanities coffee and happy hours have always been a feminist and anti-racist space, this means that our virtual hours are that as well. We support each other. Um, harassment and discrimination are not tolerated. Most importantly, our digital humanities community here operates from a place of care. Um, as I said, we support one another's work, safety and livelihood. Together, we strive to uplift voices and perspectives from marginalized communities and underrepresented communities. And I look forward to planning and announcing fall semester events for this group and our community so that we can grow and learn together. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jacob Green, uh, who will be presenting on experiments with mobile augmented reality and humanities research. So Jacob Green is an assistant professor of English in the writing, rhetorics, and literacies area. His research explores the rhetorical potential of place-based digital writing technologies from mobile augmented reality applications to GPS guided audio tours. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in composition studies, enculturation, computers and composition, and Kairos. So thank you so much, Jake, for joining us today. Um, thank you for taking time out of the end of your summer and uh, course prep time to present. And I will hand the virtual mic over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Liz, um, and everyone for coming. Uh, does everyone hear me OK? Just a thumbs up. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I've been, I've been at ASU for a couple of years now. and. Uh, had a few opportunities to kind of work with the AHR, IHR and some things. Um, so this project kind of stems from larger research that I've been doing uh, in the area of kind of mobile media studies um, and kind of thinking of how in the digital humanities we can think about the turn towards more mobile uh, and ubiquitous forms of computing, um, not only as just a technical shift kind of in something we do with computers, but kind of a more fundamental cultural and rhetorical shift in how uh, we interact with writing and other forms of digital media. Um, so I have, uh, I have some slides. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Everyone see that OK? Yes. OK, great. Um, so let me put this back. Sorry, it makes your mouse disappear. You do zoom sometimes. That should work. Um, okay, so yeah, like I said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of my research in mobile media, um, what that looks like, what, what that looks like for me, um, and talk about some of the projects that I've created. Um, and I titled this Experiments with Augmented Reality because um, I first kind of began working with this technology as a complete novice while I was in uh, my graduate program. Um, and I really wanted to think through how as digital humanists, when we're worth working with technologies, uh, trying to avoid this concept of like mastery or, you know, like a tech perfect technical know how when you're approaching a new technology, but really more kind of thinking about it as more of an exploratory sandbox for what what is the potential 
of this technology? How can we work with it uh, in new ways? Um, so that's kind of the experimental tack that I take. Um, so something I like to like to focus on uh, before I get too far is kind of this, like I mentioned a second ago, the shift that we're seeing in computing. Um, so just in the last um, decade or so, um, we've seen smartphone adoption triple um, kind of across the globe. Um, so the main way people are acting with or interacting with computers is through things like smartphones and tablets. Um, and for a little bit, this was kind of mostly just um, the same experiences we did on desktop and laptop computers, we started doing on smartphones, things like email, um, you know, just kind of did those things on the go. Um, but since then, you know, since like the last, you know, 10 years or so, we've seen a growth of uh, kind of web 2.0 technologies, things like user generated content, you know, growth of social media apps, TikTok, Twitter, um, things that allow people to kind of interact with information uh, much more in the moment. Um, so you think of Web 2.0, this, this is more like timely media, things that we can do like right now. Um, but even more so, we've been able to do, uh, if you've ever used an application like Uber or Lyft uh, or even Pokemon Go, uh, increasingly we're able to do stuff with digital media at specific places. So location and personalization, the localization and personalization of digital media is a growing trend in how we interact with um, computers. Um, and so, you know, ride sharing services, like I said, in Pokemon Go, just some basic examples of that. Um, so as this, as these kind of digital, um, this type of media has grown, the mobile media, uh, ubiquitous media, whatever you want to call it, kind of, some people use the word eversion for the way computing is kind of moving out of traditional kind of workspaces to just kind of everywhere into our daily lives uh, and the world. Um, uh, the kind of the approach I take to this technology in my own research follows Jason Farman's advice to think of it as a kind of creative misuse of technology. Um, so creative misuse, as he defines it, is um, how a technology can ultimately give new meaning to a space, especially when th that technology is used in ways that would counter to the initial intentions of the medium's designers. Um, so a simple example of this I like to show is if you're familiar with um, uh, Strava art, uh, which Strava is just uh, an online mapping application that people usually use for things like, you know, running or biking. And its original intention or its design was for, um, you know, just a lot of people to track their run to see how far did they run, what was their route, they could save different routes and share them with people kind of like a social media mapping application, but eventually people began to find out that they could uh, not only create little animals or, you know, entire works of art, they could spell things. Um, and so people have created different Strava art for, you know, they've done, people have done proposals. I think people have written protest messages. Um, so it's been interesting to see, you know, even a simple technology that just kind of, you know, tracks where, you know, your, com or your computer has been, where your device has been, can be creatively misused, to use Farman's language. Um, as a writing technology or some sort of expressive uh, medium. Um, so I kind of, I think this is an interesting example for how people, how new media or digital media kind of engage with different, um, there's, there's not just the technical application, but the cultural application as well. Um, so Strava is kind of what we might call a form of locative media and it, it works by just kind of it, your cell phone, you know, tracks where you are at different times as you move throughout a city. Um, but more recently, um, uh, developers have been able to leverage the um, more visual affordances of smartphones uh, with something called augmented reality, which I'll kind of briefly go over if you're not familiar with it. You might be familiar with the term virtual reality, which virtual reality, um, and this is what Rashad uh, is working on in his project with Minneapolis, is kind of a complete immersion in a virtual world. So you put on some sort of headset um, or something like that, and you're in this kind of digital environment mostly for the most part kind of disconnected to, from your immediate surroundings. Augmented reality on the other hand actively engages with your immediate physical space. Um, so a simple example is the IKEA smartphone app where you can download, you know, look around your living room and place, you know, furniture that you might want to buy. So any kind of digital content that's superimposed onto a live camera view of your surroundings. So this technology first kind of came around um, probably in the last like eight or nine years is still relatively new. Um, like the early ver earliest versions of it go back 20 or 30 years, but more recently, the most recent ones probably just eight or nine. Um, but we've also seen similar to the Strava art, some kind of creative misuses of this technology as well. 
Um, and there's a group of artists that work uh, in a collective, uh, Mark Skorik, Tomiko Thiel, uh, and Linda Chung, who I don't think is associated with them. Um, but they're a group of artists who are thinking about this technology and how it can be appropriated to create kind of, um, you know, everyday critiques of different public or private spaces. Uh, so Mark Skorik's A Leak in Your Hometown, this is one of the earliest, I think, art projects with augmented reality that I'm familiar with. Um, and basically the, the application worked by if you scanned any BP logo, um, it would overlay this kind of black pipe gushing oil and it was a critique of the, um, to raise awareness about the uh, continued effects of the deep, deep water horizon oil spill. Um, so actually all these projects are kind of environmentally related and similarly Linda Chung's project is one, uh, it's an augmented reality mural in Miami about the effects of climate change in the city. And Tamika feels clouding green uh, is an AR application um, that showcases the harmful effects of cloud computing technologies. Um, so all of these are accessible you know, through, every, through user smartphones. And the kind of the idea is thinking about how this technology can be, can be leveraged as a form maybe of critique or um, exposing something about the everyday world uh, that you might not see. Um, so I'm gonna talk about briefly, kind of borrowing from the inspiration from some of these artists, um, a few projects that I've worked on um, that have used augmented reality. Um, the first one is uh, it's called the Ghost Bikes Mapping Project that I did uh, with one of my friends and colleagues, Madison Jones, uh, around 2017. Um, and if you're not familiar with Ghost Bikes, um, Ghost Bikes are uh, memorials for cyclists who've been killed um, or hit by a, a car um, in some sort of urban space. Um, and typically they're, they're erected by cycling advocates, advocates um, and serve as reminders of like a tragedy, the tragedy that took place there. Um, and typically, you know, a city, you may have seen some, I think there's a few in the Phoenix area. I haven't seen a ton of them, um, but they're typically locked there and they're just completely spray painted white, um, maybe a little bit of information. Um, and for the most part, so the, the idea of this advocacy organization is to raise awareness about um, uh, lack of infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians in different areas of a city. Um, but in many cases, ghost bikes only remain for probably like a week or two um, if they're kind of, if people are going to check on them, but eventually they're either removed or stolen um, in some cases. So the idea for our project was to think about AR as a way of kind of replacing these memorials back in spaces where they'd been removed. Um, so we did this in uh, Jacksonville and we created an AR application that when you go to these spaces that have had the ghost bikes removed, uh, you'd be able to see a digital version of the bike um, and kind of learn about kind of the effects, like different policies that have been in that place, uh, that particular area of town um, that may have led to that death where there was, you know, bad road designs, um, you know, other things that have been happening uh, in the city. Um, so this project was kind of a way to think about AR, how can AR kind of be used to replace something uh, in a location where it had been erased or removed. Um, and so this is uh, this first picture. It's kind of an image of how it looks like, a mocked up image of how it would look like if you go to one of the intersections uh, where the application works. Um, so that was one of them. And I can go into more, like I told Liz, I can go into more detail on a few of these projects if we need to uh, at the end. Um, and I've also used, so I also, a lot of my research um, is about how writers are using new technologies um, to create different kind of public experiences. Um, so there's a lot of pedagogical applications that I've used for um, augmented reality. Um, I didn't realize the music was still on this video, so apologies, I made this a while ago. Um, so this is, a, this is a project that I had some students do at my previous institution to think about AR, how it can engage with kind of like their local campus spaces. Uh, and they used uh, an application to create an augmented reality history tour uh, of the campus. And so I'm gonna play this real quick uh, and I'll try to turn down the music. And I'll turn Created by undergraduate students at the University of Florida, You Discover is an augmented reality tour of UF's historic campus. Beginning at the corner of University Avenue and 13th Street, the tour guides users to augmented reality triggers hidden throughout campus. When scanned with the You Discover app, these triggers overlay multimedia historical content within the physical space of UF's campus. Download You Discover on Google Play. So this project was, um, it kind of served a couple of functions. Um, uh, number one, I think it gave students an opportunity 
to think about new media and how it can be used and think about modality and how they might want to leverage different modalities when they know that you know their reader or viewer is in a specific location. So the application worked, but you can only access certain content if you were, you know, I don't know, in front of a certain historic building on campus or in a certain area. Um, so doing that allowed them to kind of think about AR to, to kind of interrogate AR as a kind of writing technology and experiment with it in that way. Um, it was also a really great way to think about um, uh, kind of how project-based learning assignments could work uh, in new media writing courses or digital humanities courses because um, it allowed them to kind of so to kind of go out of the classroom and do something so I thought using AR was kind of a great way to connect the students to a place outside of the classroom which is kind of one of the one of the common goals for many DH courses that I've been uh, a part of. Um, so the latest project I've been working on uh, with AR specifically uh, is an app called Remixing Obama Hope. And this stems from um, a research chapter that I did recently about the Obama Hope image and the whole, the whole collection's actually about um, the Obama Hope image specifically um, and how it kind of functioned as both a meme, um, kind of a cultural icon, how it circulated, how, how it was remixed and adapted in different ways. Um, so in my chapter, I try to think about how could we use how could we use AR basically to um, number one identify and learn more about um, different remixed versions of the Obama Hope image? So uh, on the left, this is that's Shepard Fairey's original image, and then the middle one um, of Big Bird uh, is a remixed version, obviously um, that was created, I believe, in response to uh, is when Mitt Romney was running at some point, and there was talk of you know PBS being defunded. There was the uh, the Big Bird Obama Hope meme kind of came around, began circulating again. Um, so the app uh, that I created, um, the prototype will, if you scan some of these remixed versions of uh, the Obama Hope image, it would just kind of tell you a little bit. It would be kind of like if you've ever been to that site, um, knowyourmeme.com. It kind of works like that where it will identify what the, what the remixed version is and just tell you a little bit about its history um, who created it, like what its effects were, how it circulated. Um, and I, a brief, vi not very great video I made yesterday showing how the app works. So it tells you to scan, find a certain image, which right now I had pulled up on my computer. And then if you scan it, it'll kind of tell you about the style of remix that it's using. And there's some other functionalities that I don't show here in terms of uh, it'll, there's like an audio overlay as well that'll kind of tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so it does, it does that for four different images. And the idea here is to just show how AR might function um, in a more robust version of this app as a way of identifying different types of images, how we could use it to study images um, potentially or connect publics to different ideas um, about different uh, widely circulated public images. Um, so that's, a, that's the latest one I've been working on. Um, uh, so before, I'm probably running out of time, but uh, I'll talk briefly about working with AR, some of the barriers, um, things I've hit up against. Number one's probably sustainability um, and digital decay. I've worked with a lot of different AR technologies um, just in like the last five or six years. And I can probably say there's like one or two that are still around. There's a handful that um, I've had created my own projects in, I've had students create augmented reality projects in, and the platforms are gone either because the company uh, that created it was, was profit driven and they couldn't get funding again, or you know maybe it was a DH initiative and the libraries are just have been deprecated and I can't get, you know it's people doing this for free and so it's hard to get uh, versions of it again. So the technology itself kind of um, dying out is a concern. Um, and getting, actually getting access to the apps. Even if you create an app, having it work on different mobile devices, I'm sure many of you know, just the, the mobile device market is based on kind of a planned obsolescence so that they wanna get you to buy a new phone every year or two. Um, so that makes it difficult to kind of have sustainable mobile um, projects, I guess, uh, in a certain way. So sustainability has been a concern. I, I've tried to get around that by documenting the projects if I write about them in any way to kind of talk about them. Uh, the other one is access, obviously related to sustainability and uptake. Um, so many of these technologies, they're not, um, they have a lot of different modalities available to them, but they're not always super accessible. 
uh, in terms of you know captioning uh, on them, uh, even you know finding finding the finding the applications themselves. Um, augmented reality is not super widely known uh, for many people, so it's still kind of in early stages. So it can be tough um, to kind of get buy-in in some instances. But um, in cases where we have done like public projects with people, and you know we have like tablets available maybe for people to to look at for an AR project, people are usually really interested and want to do uh, want to do the project, but um, there is some kind of skepticism over how it works. You know, we're, we're kind of used to technologies working very instantly now, especially with our phones. So if you have a confront something where it's like, well, it's not working perfectly, it can be kind of a tough sell. Um, and then the last one, uh, corporate control and censorship. So a lot of these, um, a lot of the air technologies are controlled by kind of a few main companies. And I actually ran into this problem when I was teaching uh, my writing through media course. Uh, with augmented reality, and I would do this experiment with students where I'd ask them to, you know, create an augmented reality critique of Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola logo, and they would do something, and, and you know, the idea was that they would scan it, and like people would, you know, learn about like, you know, very great, <laughs> they would learn about like Coca-Cola or something. I was like, try to do an AR critique of Coke, and they would do it and try to access it, and it would be blocked by the particular AR platform that we were using because Coke had a corporate deal with that AR platform to block any other kind of augmentations of the Coca-Cola logo. And so um, there is a concern, you know, people who are augmenting the space, like the companies in charge of it are the same companies that are currently in charge of a lot of our other digital problems. Um, and so there is concerns over, you know, who's, who has the right to augment certain spaces, um, who's in control of regulating uh, different augmented reality content, you know, um, you know, this, and you may have seen something similar when Pokemon Go was really popular. Um, they found out that people could still play at, you know, sacred spaces um, or memorial spaces like Auschwitz, even the World Trade Center. Um, people could still catch monsters, digital monsters in these spaces that were kind of set aside, um, you know, for these specific cultural purposes. Um, so there's some, you know, some issues there in terms of how the technology is or isn't being regulated. Um, and so one, one area I've, I've kind of been working on recently is developing some open source tutorials for working with AR um, that, to kind of get around some of these issues to have, uh, have a little bit more control um, over the kind of the end product and the workflow so that, because I've had some projects that I created in some platforms that were then, um, you know, that are now completely defunct because the company went out of business or something. So uh, lately, and this is the Remixing Obama Hope app that I created recently, it was created in the Unity and Vuforia development environment, which gives you a little bit more control, um, but does have some, you know, a higher kind of technical learning curve uh, to using it. But uh, hopefully with this, and I partner with the programming historian for this series, and I've only, I say series, but I've still only done one lesson for them, but I, I say series is a hopeful, uh, hopeful thing because I want to create more um, to encourage other people to kind of create AR stuff because I think um, for this to kind of take off in DH, um, I, I want more people to kind of be working with it um, and thinking about how it might work in different kind of spaces or partnering with different institutions. Um, and so I'm hoping, so kind of for all the projects that I'm doing, this is go back to the idea of experimentation. Um, I want us to kind of to kind of be experimenting with this technology because I think there is interest in it being used, particularly with, you know, how, how you know every newer generations are more interested in mobile media. People are kind of uptaking mobile media more and more. Um, getting people kind of create these projects um, through AR or through, you know, if it's like a guided audio tour or something, um, can kind of facilitate more learning about what this technology can do uh, in terms of a, a cultural resource or a writing technology. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Jake. I'm going to use my reactions to clap. Great. Thank you. So uh, if anyone has questions, raise your hands or just type in chat. Um, I always forget to say that at the top of the virtual hour so that we have questions um, throughout. But please go ahead and, and pop into chat if we do. I have so many questions. At one point in my notes, I wrote, who controls AR all in caps, <laughs> um, which is kind of terrifying to think about this virtual space out there that is being controlled by capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. But everything's controlled by capitalism. Right. Yeah, um, I think I might wanna start with the question um, 
I'd love to hear more about the projects, but I think maybe starting with, can you talk a little bit more about the process of app development um, as a way, maybe as a way to engage with publics, app development as a way to engage with publics? Sure. Um, yeah, I, th I think app development's a great way to engage with publics if you can get your apps on the app store <laughs> and, and get them to stay there. Um, uh, so for the most, so I've done, uh, so in terms of app development can mean a few different things. So I've done a few things that were like digital projects that used kind of proprietary technologies. So there was a handful of augmented reality software, creation software that there was a few different ones. They're called like Layar, Erasma, HP Reveal. Um, there's a few available now. Um, and those, and those are pretty good. Um, but they're kind of limited in terms of what you can actually put in the application itself. Um, so that's why we sh that's why I kind of shifted to using the Unity and Vuforia uh, environment, uh, where you so that works basically where you can create your own app and submit it to the to the Google to the Android Play Store uh, or the Apple App Store. Um, but again, you know, if you go the creating apps is great, but if you go in the App Store, it's just it's millions of apps out there. You know, it's just kind of going out into the ether. Um, so for the most part, the most successful ones I've done, they usually, especially for something like augmented reality, where you're like, download this app and go to this specific place and scan this particular image and then look at this thing, it requires a lot. So the most successful ones have usually, like engaging publics, have been paired with like an event of some kind. Um, one was at a conference I did, um, like instead of a traditional panel, uh, we did like a walking panel. And so it just went for maybe like a half mile down the street and we showcased, um, we showcased an app that we were working on. Um, and then another one, another one we did uh, was at a, like a local nature preserve and talked about the app, like talked about the effects of climate change. Um, and those were, those were really good projects. And we even had people like, I think the great way of connecting with public's idea, to go back to that, the great thing is that you're out there, even if you get four or five people like with a tablet or phone, like looking up, people are like, what are you guys doing, you know? And that's a great, like you look kind of weird out there doing it. So it is a great way to, to connect with people just literally in the streets. Like if we want to bring DH to the streets, it's a great way to do it because you're out there just with a phone. And we had people, I think we did it in Detroit and we had people just kind of like, what is that called? And we told them about it, like, oh, I'm gonna look that up. And it was like a history app. Um, so it is a great way. And I think it gets like, um, it's a good kind of bridge between like, you know, People don't want to just use digital media when they go into spaces because we have digital media everywhere. But it's a good way of connecting, I think, um, people's you know interest in like places and locations um, and technology in a way that doesn't hopefully detract from your experience of that place. I love that, and I was thinking a little bit while you we were talking too about how it 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 is also about embodying the story that you're trying to tell, right? Because it's right. it's a different way of telling a history or of something. The, the AR technology that I think are the AR application, the application of augmented reality, there we go, that I'm most familiar with is the James Joyce project, um, where you can tour all the places in Ulysses, right, that the main character in Ulysses goes. Um, but again, pop, uh, raise your hand or pop into chat if you have questions, but I'm happy to keep asking Jake questions. Um, I wonder if you would, chat a little bit more about Unity for those that are interested in kind of experimenting with an open source version of augmented reality. Um, I, I'm going to look up and link to and chat your um, programming historian tutorial, which I did not know was there. And now I'm going to go learn. But yes. if you could chat a little bit more about that. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so so Unity is a, it's a video game development environment. So if you've played like Red, I think Red Dead Redemption 2 was created in Unity. Angry Birds was created in Unity. Um, so it's, it's a, if you do, are interested in Unity, just be aware. It, it's a lot. Like it's a lot to download. You need a good couple hours to even download it. Um, but um, I found that it's a fairly, once you kind of get used to it, um, it is a fairly simple program to kind of drag stuff around. Um, and for the most part, the tutorial, so I put together, basically cobbled together based on my own internet searches. If you've anyone's ever worked with a, a DH tool, you know, you spend most of your time just Googling things around. So basically my tutorial is 
let me save you the weeks it took me to Google all of this information. I'll put it in one place uh, and kind of walk through the process. So uh, basically Unity works, it's a, it's a vision-based augmented reality program. So you can upload any sort of visual trigger. Um, so usually called a trigger image or a target image. Um, and in the case of my, the Obama Hope app, um, it's like remixed, uh, remixed versions of the Obama Hope. And so it basically what you're doing is you're telling the phone when you see this image, when your phone identifies that, that this image is present in the camera view, do this thing. So it's a basic if then statement. And usually the thing to do is, you know, activate some sort of digital media file, whether it's, you know, an audio file, um, a video, um, a 3D animation, um, and Unity is kind of capable of handling all those different things. Um, and the nice thing about Unity is you can build the entire app in there, like with the menu, everything like that. Um, and then it'll export uh, your files both as um, an APK file, which you can submit for Android phones, which I know I, a lot of people have iPhones, I notice, and they're like, who uses Android? But over 50% of the world is on, more than 50% of the world is on Android. Um, so you should, if you want to develop apps, try to do both. And Unity is great for that. So it'll, it'll make an APK file and it will allow you to export to Xcode to build um, an, uh, an app that you can send to uh, Apple phones or iPhones. Um, and it is, a, again, it's a bit of a learning curve, but the tutorial that I created just walks, just walks you through kind of a simple, how to create a simple application. Um, if you wanted, I think it's like augmenting like a cover of a book or something with the author's image. Um, but you could extend that same idea if you can do that to, um, for, for example, if you work with maybe like a local park or a cultural space and you wanted to augment different images uh, or like historical markers or something, um, you could do the same thing uh, with the kind of the logic uh, that's in that tutorial. Thank you, that was perfect. I think I just wanted to hear, every time I hear Unity mentioned, I always wanna learn it and then I never have time to because I'll never have time to. It's a lot, yeah, check out the tutorial it, um, again, a lot of this technology, it's, it's a very new technology. And I've actually done, this is the second revision on that tutorial because people started doing it and they were like, something's breaking. And they sent me an email like, hey, people are wanting to use, so I had to redo it again with updated stuff. Um, so if you do, if anyone goes through it, let me know if something's not working. Um, and I can, I can see if I can help you troubleshoot. Um, but it, it's really great. And I, that's the one that I had students, undergraduate students who were in an English class. They worked with Unity. Um, they hated it at times, but kind of when you show them like, hey, you can make an app that, and just like send it to your own phone. They, I think that idea is cool to them. They're like, oh, I can like interact with this ecology of media and information that usually is just like, I'm only a consumer of these apps. I just download them. But now it's like, oh, these are kind of the tools and the processes through which apps are you know, distributed. And I think that's a good learning process too. And DH is like, it's not just these tools, but it's this kind of whole like, you know, marketplace, I guess, or in investigating those kind of things too is really cool. That's so good. And I'm reminded if anyone hasn't seen, um, Quinn Dombrowski just posted something on failure and making mistakes and how we should be developing tools in digital humanities. For those that don't know, Digital Humanities 2020 was supposed to be happening right now in Ottawa, but instead they moved it all virtually. So there's been a lot this week. Um, and if, if you're interested in that uh, reading by Quinn Dabrowski, I think that there's this um, kind of movement and it's been growing over the past like decade in DH, right? That like failure and making mistakes is okay and um, maybe good. Um, and I like that that was kind of a big part of your presentation is that, you know, as humanists, we're not necessarily taking classes to engage with these technologies. Mm -hmm. We're learning them in a different way. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I have another question, if not. Sure, yeah. No, I, th I think failure is uh, part and parcel of uh, definitely how I work with technology. Um, and I think, and I think it's good too. Um, kind of to keep in mind, I think with the with the projects that I've worked on, um, is like kind of what the what the goal is for it. You know, if it's if you're using this in a course, you know, and I'll tell students my goal is like for us to to th think about this technology, you know, write about this technology, use this technology, and our goal is to kind of um, you know we're kind of thinking through it, use it, you know, and in the process we're going to use the technology and kind of apply it in these different contexts. You know, our goal is not to you know, sell a million 
downloads of you know an app you know i make a lot of money it's it's to kind of investigate it um, in this way and so that's kind of like the critical critical making approach i guess is kind of about failure you learn a lot kind of through failures or the things you hit up against or you know i think i've had students augment i had one student who wanted to do like it was a really cool like counter augmented reality tour of a grocery store um to talk about the ethical or unethical like uh practices in the meat and dairy industry um and she ran into some issues with copyright in terms of what are like if you want to scan this branded logo it's a copyrighted image with an ar app that a student made is that fair use um, because it's critique does the company have the right to deny critical augmentations of its logo um it because it doesn't have the right to deny um, like if I go to make, if I go make like a satirical version of, you know, the Pepperidge Farms logo or, you know, something like that, I'm allowed to do that under fair use. But does that apply the same to AR? And so kind of doing that, it made those questions more salient, I think, by, by making and, and doing with them. And that, you know, you could say, so I didn't, so it's kind of a failure, I guess, like the project kind of stalled at that point, but it, it made some interesting questions, you know. And so I know there was, um, we were, some of us were chatting a little bit before everyone was online. And so I'll go ahead and, and if the person who originally wanted to ask this question wants to ask it, let me know. But if not, I'm going to take it. Okay, I think we're good. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about how developing a digital humanities project and um, writing the book, right, at the same time. Um, how how that is as as a as a faculty member, especially kind of a, a, a on the tenure track mm -hmm. faculty member. Um, I can't remember exactly how I was going to phrase that, but something about how there's the digital project and then there's the research project, and sometimes they're the same thing, but sometimes they're not the same thing. Um, and I think that's an interesting conversation and something that our group has been having a lot over the past year. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's uh, definitely a perennial question. Um, I think for me. Um, and it can feel, I think it can feel jarring at times. I, because my approach, I think, especially when I, I wasn't on the tenure track and I was more kind of doing projects and maybe writing articles and, and that approach maybe seemed to work pretty well. Like I would do a project and then kind of immediately write about it. The ghost spikes mapping project we did. Um, I was able to do it and like through that write about it and then kind of set it aside. Um, and maybe it's just the nature of doing like a longer monograph type of piece. It feels a little disconnected because I'm trying to kind of also theorize this technology as a kind of writing um, in space. Um, but at the same time, the, the main thing I mentioned is you kind of feel, if I don't have like a lot of active projects I'm doing, you feel a little disconnected from um, kind of like, like you said, that like embodiment, like understanding how it works, kind of thinking, there's, there's productive thinking that goes on in kind of that building process. If I'm working with Unity, uh, if I'm doing a project or running into issues or coming up with, oh, this would be a cool idea. Um, uh, it kind of, there is kind of a back and forth, which can kind of feel a little bit jarring at times. Um, but like I said, I, I do love writing and I think it's important to kind of theorize through these technologies. I don't know if, you know, a print book and then like companion things like a companion app for a print book uh versus like a print book uh, companion website companion app i'm like i can't do all these these are too many companions <laughs> like um and i and i've kind of you know you try to kind of adapt you know what in what do i like ideally i would love to have like an amazing augmented reality application and feature for my monograph that you know does all these cool things um but there's, you know, obviously, you know, time costs associated with that. I don't want the scholarship in my book project to suffer um, from, you know, focusing on like technical issues that are bound to arise in doing that. I don't want to spend all this time on a new technology that then Unity decides, ah, we're abandoning AR. And then my entire project is gone. And I was hoping this for tenure, you know, I don't think Microsoft Word's going to go defunct. So I, I'd rather put my head my bets there. Um, so yeah, there's some issues. I think TMP stuff, especially for new technologies, I'm my my big hesitancy has been: Do I want to in, invest time that I need to show like I'm engaging in this scholarship, but then to have it just like poof disappear one day because you know the app store decides to reject my app my app, which has happened. They'll they'll just take it down. 
because there's requirements, you know, to keep your app on those stores. Um, and if I submit my tenure file and I tell them about this cool app I did, and then, you know, Google and say, you know, somebody in Google decided to get rid of my app, you know, right before then. So those things are, you know, can be a concern. So that's why I try to go with um, uh, creating projects, writing about documenting them in that way. But um, those sustainability issues that are, are interesting. Um, but I haven't found like a perfect solution for them quite yet. I don't think anybody's found a solution to digital humanities sustainability. So I think these are, thanks so much for posing these kind of questions though, because especially for the kind of new emerging technology that a lot of digital humanists are engaging with and especially augmented reality, I think that the questions of sustainability are a little bit more interesting slash dire than someone who's, you know, using the text encoding initiative to create a digital edition, which is something that, you know, we've been working on as a community for like 30 years, right? Um, we kind of know how to sustain those projects, or at least we think we do until the apocalypse. So. Right, right. And some of them might be, you know, and that's the thing with why I try to do like events, you know, for, for an AR project or like public events or something, so that it's, it, people can engage with that experience. And if the app disappears someday, um, you know, that's, that's okay. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that kind of like go away. Um, it'd be nice if, if, they, if there's a platform to stick around. And ideally, um, something I'd like to do and have talked with other colleagues is pursuing a, a larger grant project or something that would be an AR creation tool for, you know, kind of humanities research or humanities platform that kind of was more robust and a lot of those um, maybe technical issues could be addressed so that if somebody you know, a humanist who's researching, um, you know, a local, you know, a local park or, uh, you know, some kind of place-based humanities research could use this application, um, you know, either within their research or as a pedagogical tool um, or to engage with the public maybe in some way about their research um, or doing work on cities like uh, Rashad is doing, It'd be a fantastic way to do that. Um, that, I think that's, I think that would be the way forward is some kind of, um, like there exists for other DH tools like, like Voyant or, uh, I don't know if that's a DH tool specifically, it's so popular, but um, like a DH tool that other people can use. I think AR is in need of, of something like that, but um, the cost to get an AR, to get somebody, a developer to do AR stuff is a hefty fee. Um, so I haven't, <laughs> I haven't tried to ask anyone to do it yet. So if anyone has a final question, please go ahead and pop it into chat or, or raise your hand. But I think this might be leading into the final question I want to ask is I, we had a place-based digital humanities project kind of, well, two place-based digital humanities projects really open up our summer digital humanities virtual hours. Um, one was Mark Dubow and Catherine O'Donnell talking about the plague project that they're doing that's about how places and spaces and people are reacting to coronavirus and also Rashad Shabazz who was chatting about the Minneapolis sound and his virtual reality project about how sound is rooted in place right and this is another project that's really talking about place-based humanities slash place-based digital humanities mm -hmm. and if you had any final thoughts about maybe place-based humanities and how that field of study um, inspires you that might be a really cool place to end yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I do think, I think place-based humanities stuff is, it's a growing element in the field for sure. Um, and I think some of the way the DH kind of facilitates cross-disciplinary or inter interdisciplinary research, place-based stuff um, does as well. Um, and I'm thinking back to, um, I think you may have had him as a, as a guest at some point, uh, but Dave Tell's research with the Emmett Till Memorial site, uh, which I think is a good example of, of how place-based research of us kind of moving beyond just this containerized notion of space is like, oh, Arizona happens to be the place where this culture happens, or Kansas happens to be where this happens. It's not really in his research and, and others talk about places. It's kind of a, um, it's an actor in that kind of situation. It's an element of that kind of cultural ecology and place place itself kind of contributes to the formation of that culture and the geographies. And he talks about uh, Emmett Till's memorialization and the politics surrounding that, how the geography of that space played a role 
um, in the story, in cultural memories and public memories about his death, its importance as civil rights movements, things that had been erased. Um, and so I think uh, for mobile media, I think mobile media can play a huge role in kind of how we can learn about those elements of place in a different way. Um, how humanists can kind of in, engage publics maybe in, in investigating those elements of their local spaces that, you know, are just being converted to parking lots or Chipotle's or something. How can we, how can we use these technologies to kind of learn about those erased histories um, for sure? It seems to be kind of a recurring theme um, in a lot of this is how can we, how can we leverage these technologies to amplify, uh, you know, marginalized histories, experiences, identities. Um, and that's kind of what I'm kind of investigating in the book project too, as uh, so what, what role does, you know, mobile media play kind of in that uh, trajectory for the humanities? I won't spoil that amazing answer by repeating any of it, but I took notes about all of it. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us, Jake. Thanks to everyone for being here today. Thanks everyone who will watch this YouTube video. Um, I absolutely love that this was our final wrap up for the summer. Um, if you have any final thoughts, please. Um...